I'm not a big fan of Lucha Libre. That's not to say I don't enjoy Lucha when I do get to see it, but of all the styles of professional wrestling in the world, Lucha is the one that's remained mostly alien to me. It's not really the subject of conversation in the more popular English-speaking circles of the wrestling media. You'll often struggle to find people list a Lucha match in their top 10 favorite matches of any given year. And again, None of this actually speaks to the quality of Lucha Libre itself. Instead, it speaks to how the international wrestling culture perceives Lucha. Often, most people have a passing knowledge of it. They know of its reputation, maybe even have vague notions of its history. And yet, the most personal connection one might have to it, on average, is enjoying luchadors that eventually work in other places like the American independent scene or eventually even in the WWE or AEW. I have semi-regularly tried to remedy this disconnect with lucha. Over the many years that I've been watching wrestling, I'll occasionally dip my toes back in, finding recommended matches across various decades, checking out hyped matches from the present day, and sometimes they hit, and sometimes they don't. This year, I made a concerted effort to try to watch more Lucha, both past and present. As I watch more of it, I feel that it's important for me to discuss what I see, just to articulate my own perceptions as I continually form my ideas of what constitutes good Lucha. And I can think of no better way to apply these new observations and thoughts than by taking a look at the most hype match from Mexico all year. The mask versus mask match between Aereo and Villano Tercero Jr. For those of you out there that aren't overly familiar with Lucha Libre, there's a few basic things worth noting before you watch this match. Firstly, it's traditional in Lucha to wrestle matches under 2 out of 3 falls rules, and that is the case in this particular match. So should you be starting a deep dive into Lucha, keep that in mind. Secondly, while championships are of course a major part of Lucha Libre, as it is with any wrestling culture, titles pale in comparison to the significance of the lucha de apuesta. In English, literally a wager match. Lucha de apuesta matches involve wrestlers putting significant aspects of their identity on the line. Typically, this means wagering either one's hair or one's mask. Losing one's mask, especially, is perhaps the greatest loss that any luchador can suffer in their career, as their mask pretty much makes up their entire identity as a performer. And that's what's on the line in this match between Aereo and Villano Tercero Jr. The loser must unmask, essentially losing their defining trait in pro wrestling. It's the most high-stakes situation a luchador can be in. With that house cleaning out of the way, let's get into the things I love about this match and about Lucha Libre in general, starting with... This isn't something that I often discuss in detail unless I'm discussing something like the Kobashi and Kikuchi Can-Am tag team match. But I found that when approaching Lucha Libre, atmosphere might be the most important aspect of the viewing experience. The crowd, the arena, the spectacle of the entrances, these are much more integral to the experience of Lucha Libre than they might be in any other genre of pro wrestling. I think part of this is because from what I understand, Lucha Libre isn't really consumed or marketed towards, for the lack of a better term, smarkier audiences. They don't particularly care for what someone like Dave Meltzer or even myself might consider to be classical wrestling psychology or aesthetics, and in part, that's why you don't really hear a lot about Lucha in the more mainstream coverage of pro wrestling. It's not made for the people who have the loudest voices in those communities. That's not to say that Lucha Libre is devoid of wrestling psychology, structure, or depth. 
far from it, and we'll get into that a little later on. What I think I'm trying to get at is that there's a certain primacy and immediacy to Lucha Libre that isn't something you see in most other genres of pro wrestling. There is a structure, but things are much more in the moment without exactly being devoid of either meaning or substance. And things like pure aesthetic play into that to a much more noticeable degree than elsewhere in the world. One of the ways this aesthetic appeals to me the most is in the venue. I have yet to see a pro wrestling venue in Mexico that I didn't absolutely love. All these arenas have such a sense of character and history to them, such that one could easily identify them at a glance. This particular match, for example, takes place in the Gimnasio Municipal Josere Neri Santos in Ciudad Suarez. I don't know what to tell you guys other than the place just looks cool. It feels lived in and grimy. There's an aspect to it that's almost seedy even, and that lends a lot of legitimacy to this fight. It's something that a multi-million dollar state-of-the-art stadium in America could never replicate. And on a more personal note, there's something about these venues that remind me of home. They remind me of covered courts or basketball arenas that can be found in pretty much every Filipino community across the country. I relate to the aesthetic because it taps into a piece of my own national culture, and I find that really interesting. And while you think this might operate on a purely aesthetic level, it actually has an influence on aspects of the match itself. Take for example the trash can that gets introduced in the second fall of the match. That's not a flimsy aluminum trash can planted under the ring for the express purpose of absorbing a wrestler's bump. It's an actual, legit trash can that was in the arena to collect, you know, trash. Real trash that gets dumped out onto the floor so that these spots can happen. Something small like that just adds a sense of realism to this match that I adore. One of the most fascinating things about Lucha Libre is how deeply ingrained it is into the Mexican national identity. No pro wrestling culture or genre in the world is as integral to a nation's cultural identity as Lucha Libre is. Even in the countries with the most dominant pro wrestling cultures, America and Japan, pro wrestling is a fringe aspect of that nation's culture. Meanwhile, the luchador mask is a ubiquitous symbol of Mexican identity, even to people who have never seen a pro wrestling match in their entire lives. That sense of heritage, lineage, and history is true on the macro level about Lucha Libre as a whole, but it also contains value on the micro level with individual workers. Let's take for example one of the competitors in this matchup, Villano Tercero Jr. The sense of lineage is in his name alone. Villano Tercero Jr. is the biological son of the late and legendary luchador Villano Tercero, who was himself part of a group of luchador brothers under the Villano name. The entire history of the Villanos follows Villano Tercero Jr., especially going into a major matchup like this one. It's an incredibly weighty history too, as Villano Tercero is not only one of the great luchadors of Lucha Libre, but was also a participant in what many people consider to be the greatest Lucha Libre match of all time, when he wrestled Atlantis in a mask versus mask match in 2000. Villano Tercero Jr.'s match against Ereo pays tribute to that legendary encounter. Ereo wins the first fall by using the same maneuver that Atlantis used to defeat Villano Tercero Jr.'s father back in 2000. It's a nice touch that rewards people who understand the legacies that people like Villano Tercero Jr. carry with them throughout their entire careers. The move still makes sense within the context of the match, and you'll enjoy it just fine without that knowledge, but having it enriches your experience in a way that's so often attempted elsewhere in wrestling, but is rarely ever done with such gravitas. 
And who knows, maybe there's people out there that find this moment melodramatic and indulgent in the same way that I've criticized similar moments for being in other matches. Perhaps I have a longer leash when it comes to Lucha Libre, seeing as I'm new to the genre. Either way, the moment is incredibly deliberate within the context of this match, and for me personally, it added a lot to it. It all plays into the theme of identity that runs through Lucha Libre as a whole. You are your mask. You are the history that that mask and that name comes with. And all of that is in jeopardy in this match. This match has a pretty clear three-act structure to go along with the two out of three falls stipulation. Clocking in at 40 plus minutes, the match utilizes a lot of space to get its story across, and it does so in a way that's pretty familiar to most of us who have been watching wrestling for any extended amount of time. It uses the standard methods of escalation and momentum shifts to create a compelling narrative that leads us through the extended runtime. The opening fall focuses primarily on mat exchanges with both men trying to outwrestle each other in a fair and standard way. There's some good trickery, some gruesome holds, and it keeps a brisk pace to keep the viewer involved. After dropping the first fall, Villano Tercero Jr. becomes much more aggressive and even goes out of his way to cheat in the second fall. It adds a new layer of suspense to the action as now the line between Rudo and Tecnico becomes clearer and solidly places our sympathies in Ereo's corner. Villano Tercero Jr.'s aggressive heel tactics work and he's able to even up the score at one apiece, leading into the third and decisive fall. Much of the early third fall continues with Villano Tercero Jr. in control, all building up to Ereo's comeback, which he makes in spectacular fashion. And from there, the third fall extends into what might as well be its own match, as it takes up about half of the total runtime of this match and has all the twists, turns, and big bumps that you might expect from an epic style match of this nature. Now, I certainly don't think the structure of this match is perfect by any means. After Ereo makes his comeback in the third fall, the narrative ebb and flow starts to get a little loose, and something like his gigantic dive off the light structure is incredibly eye-catching, yes, but also takes away from some of the urgency and roughness that made other parts of this match so strong. The bomb throwing is spectacular, and Villano Tercero Jr. does small things to add substance to it, like his weirdly compelling rope break psychology, but it does in the end become much more about escalation and a rising sense of danger than it does about being a tight and aggressively contested fight between two rivals. What I do like about this structure, though, is that it uses its maximalist approach well. The runtime provides us a sampler of all the various different styles of Lucha Libre that I enjoy so much. It runs the gamut from the mat trickery to the spectacular high flying, and even includes the roughness of a good old fashioned brawl mixed with some more modern hardcore antics. For Lucha fans and wrestling fans in general, there's probably something in here that you're bound to enjoy, and it's just a matter of getting through the lengthy runtime to see it. With half the year gone and COVID-19 continuing to ravage the world, it seems likely that no Lucha match is set to overtake this one, at least when it comes to hype from the wider wrestling world. That this match was able to break out into the wider wrestling discourse at all is already a testament to the fact that it contains enough dazzling action and big drama to appeal to wrestling fans who usually don't go out of their way to see Lucha Libre, myself included. It's far from a perfect match, and I wouldn't even say it's in the upper echelon of matches from 2020, but I do feel that it's a fitting sampler of what Lucha Libre can offer you as a wrestling fan. It's an interesting starting point, to say the least. Not an ideal one, but one that you can definitely lead you down some potentially more fascinating and compelling avenues. Whether it's seeking out the previous matches these two had, tracking their careers, or just going out of your way to see more lucha, I think that this match influences people in a net positive way. Also, there's a real sense of 
ambition and scale to it that comes across as far more sincere and less cynical than some other similar endeavors elsewhere in the world. I'd give it a four and a quarter star rating. I definitely recommend it, and I hope it keeps you guys curious about Lucha Libre. Thank you everybody for watching. A big thank you goes out to the people who supported me on Kofi, including Juan C. Gonzalez, Brendan McCarthy, Jordan Ilagan, RV Deinator, H, and Nick New, and a massive, massive thank you to my monthly Kofi supporters in Captain Jake Hartless, Jake Dieterich, Eddie Roberts, James Draper, Chick Fritz, Matt Brummett, Jacob Dickens, The Smartdown Podcast, and Spiders in My Bed. You guys are absolutely awesome. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you guys want to help the channel and support the show, please visit ko-fi.com slash Joseph Montesilio. You guys are great. Thank you again for watching and have a good one.